first of all, I, since I became interested in shamanism, which is very early, and more, since I became able to help other people, I felt closer to shamanism than to any other way. <clears throat> I regarded shamans much more advanced. Uh, I, I didn't think of myself as a shaman. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought of myself at the most as a sorcerer's apprentice. <laughs> but my way, my, my style was shamanistic mm -hmm. in that I believed in um, not so much in outer teachings, outer structures and traditions, mm -hmm. petrified knowledge, mm -hmm. but in ongoing creativity and inner guidance. Mm -hmm. I always put my inner guidance above everything, even when I had apprenticeships with specific teachers mm -hmm. and I surrender to teachers, ah, okay. but I surrender to teachers because my inner guidance told me yeah, okay. to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. um, I was a time in my life when uh, Michael Harner, who was a professor of anthropology mm -hmm. in U University of California, mm -hmm. introduced me to Carlos Castaneda mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And he used the words, I, I want you to meet this other source's apprentice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, as you, you probably know the story of how we did the first workshop of, on shamanism in yes, Italy. Excellent. Yeah, maybe you can tell a little bit about it. would be nice. Uh, well, uh, one thing remarkable about it was that Carlos Castaneda had not written any of his books yet, mm -hmm. so it was the first public uh, presentation of some of uh, what we now know of his apprenticeship with Don Juan. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was a very special experience to have Fritz Perls in the audience. He was uh, very challenging. Mm -hmm. he, and he immediately say, if that is shamanism, I'm a shaman. Mm -hmm. I approached him in a moment when people were talking in a break, mm -hmm. and I, I have described it in one of my books. In my, in my yeah, book, short book. the end of patriarchy. It's also. I, I don't remember which, yeah. but he's, he was saying to people there, "Doesn't it also happen to you that you have visions that inspire your work?" Yeah, and he told of a specific occasion in a session with a difficult patient, uh, a woman who had a very angry voice yeah. and he was not getting anywhere in the session but he closed his eyes for guidance as if to search for inspiration or new direction yeah. and then had an image of a dog barking mm -hmm. and he used this immediately and said to the woman you come across to me like a dog barking at me <coughs> and that changed the session I, uh, she was very uh, touched and says, my husband tells me the same thing. And then things started moving. And I admired his ability to be in touch with inner messages in the middle of a session, because at that point I would not have been able to be so free in looking within mm -hmm. when I had to be uh, looking at somebody else, I was nervous as a, as a young therapist, mm -hmm. thinking what to do, what to say, mm -hmm. not enough in touch with. So I thought that that is shamanic, that, yeah. that ability to connect. And there was a time when uh, I presented shamanism, uh, presented Gestalt therapy as a new shamanism. Yeah. The people were so much preoccupied with the Gestalt principle with the, gest the application of Gestalt, uh, gestalt yeah. ideas, uh, Gestalt psychology ideas, yeah, yeah. and reading Kafka, reading yeah. that kind of uh, Goldstein. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought, that's bullshit. Uh, yeah. They don't realize 
that uh, Fritz used the word for strategic reasons and for for market reasons because uh, the Gestalt was in, yeah. it was new, yeah. uh, so it was yeah. a, and that was very shamanic of his. Uh, to, to he was very smart as shamans are smart, and, of and course, then, yeah. but everybody was so serious about the Gestalt idea that that's new. They took it literally, and uh, I, I think I lost the thread now. Oh, you, you answered uh, in one uh, five of my questions. <laughs> But ah, I, so so when people were looking for theories, I said, yeah, uh, Gestalt is a kind of neo shamanism. It's uh, being guided by intuition, mm -hmm. being creative and guided by intuition, and the rest is the transmission of your being. The name, the rest, is done without you doing it, because if you have a certain consciousness at a level you will see the deformity in the other and you will have an influence on the other by your spontaneous reactions will already be enough. And who has embodied, embodied some yeah. consciousness, it was, who has simply evolved and left behind some of the sickness and some of the yeah. bad games. And this is what you, what you would call also shamanic. I, I sometimes say a shaman is a three-brained being. Mm -hmm. uh, we civilized people are one brain. We're, we live in a world where there is an imperialism of reason. Only reason is valued. Yeah. Only reason is taught in academic circles. Mm -hmm. Only reason is valid also in bureaucracies, in governments. Everything needs to be proved by reason. Yeah. There's no place for intuitive behavior. Um, so a shaman is loving somebody who was, has warmth, has, who cares, who has a charismatic position because he can help put right things that are unbalanced for lack of emotional awareness. But he's also a person who has awakened his reptilian brain, mm -hmm. a person who has the so-called secret of fire. Mm -hmm. uh, this universal trait of shamanism, which is sometimes expressed ritually, uh, has a lot to do with the awakening of the Kundalini, what in India is called the awakening mm -hmm. of Kundalini. Mm -hmm. And I say the uh, Kundalini awakening is the awakening of the reptilian brain within us, the, the awakening of the instinctual self which has been uh, put into a jail, put into a box mm -hmm. by civil civilized life. So this is a form of animal health. Yes. We, we are We have an animal self that goes against civilization, goes against the, was, it's not, uh, not even valued. And many of the myths are myths against the animal self, like the myth of the snake in paradise. Mm -hmm. She is the, the evil one, she's the embodiment. Yeah. Because the pleasure principle, to speak Freudian term, the pleasure principle needed to be overrun yeah. by the reality principle. With the so-called reality principle, I think reality principle is not the principle of reason, it's the principle of the reality of living in a patriarchal world that is at odds with instinctual nature. <coughs> so, so it's a kind of... Freud, I think, fell mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the patriarchal yeah. Uh, trap yeah. in calling it reality the principle. He gave it a noble name yes. and, it, and it's the principle of repression in yes. which we live. Yes, uh, he represents a human condition as one of inner antagonism, mm -hmm. but this inner antagonism wouldn't be so in a 
fully evolved person. Of course. Whose parts are yeah. integrated. Yes. They dance together. Yes. The animal is in a good friend of this yeah. so-called superego that's not super yeah. in the sense of yes. a top dog uh, yeah. becoming a tyrant. Yes. I have used that sentence of Fritz as, uh, an ex as an expression of the shamanic spirit mm -hmm. because what he meant by son of a bitch, he, uh, he meant what uh, the expression usually means in English, mm -hmm. somebody who can get angry, who can get mad mm -hmm. and uh, that's not polite, that's not valued, uh, a son of a bitch, you say it's generally looked disdainfully as only only as a, as a problem. He, he putting it next to son of I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Putting it next to son of God. Yes. He, he could have said a son of God who has integrated his animal self. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And therefore, can get angry when some situation is uh, makes it normal, makes it legitimate to get angry, mm -hmm. and you could indulge in it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a kind of anger that comes from um, from clear perception, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was the, so much of his work. He was good to people because he was very good at cutting egos down. Yeah. Yes, it's... Uh, he didn't like... Uh, he wouldn't have liked the metaphor of purification of sin. Mm anything with the smell of Christianity ah, yeah, yeah. he would have disliked. Yeah. I remember his saying to a Protestant theologian who was very fond of Buber and uh, brought in the word God in his, um, in his session yeah. and um, Fritz said, God stands between you and I. You are bringing God between us, meaning that he was God was uh, like a foreign body yeah. <coughs> in this relationship. We, we, we are rational beings normally. Yeah. We, we only get an education for a rational mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the two other brains? Just a little bit what it means for you? Well, I have just said uh, there is a reptilian brain. The primitive brain is a reptilian brain. This instinctual brain. Uh, when the psychoanal in psychoanalysis, it is said that the, the instinct is uh, love and aggression, libido and aggression, mm -hmm. sex and aggression. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a good description. Uh, uh, of the main pillars of the instinctual world as these dimensions, but also intuition. Mm -hmm. It's a, like a, the, it's what like plants who know where w to go with the roots for water, or, or flowers that turn to the sun. Uh, I would say we have an instinctual function that manifests as intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't know what's good for us through rational means alone. The world is too complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, love, human love, it just has not related to that. It's something like a primitive sense of almost, it's almost a magical sense. That's why uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce wrote a book called Magical Child mm -hmm. and describes many situations where children know things that parents don't even realize that children know. Mm -hmm. Because they're not expected to understand so much. Yeah. 
when a child says to the mother, what's the matter with you, mummy? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. But she doesn't realize that he is picking up something that it would be fundamental to, yeah. to respond to in that mm -hmm. moment. That it would be an opportunity for her and it would be a way of developing a, a truth, truthful relation mm -hmm. to answer that. And animals have something we might call clairvoyant. I remember reading about a fox who moved its uh, cubs to, to a site about some yards away mm -hmm. and, and made a hole mm -hmm. to protect them, to put them in, in, a, in the slope of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And very soon after she had finished doing this, it's like a moving to her house, and there was a crumbling down, and the, mm -hmm. and the f place where the whale was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, humans cannot predict earthquakes, cannot uh, movements of the earth mm -hmm. with the best uh, means, uh, but animals can. Yes. And when the the whales, uh, all the the floods in uh, yeah. different parts of the world, the animals go to the yes. high places. They mm. know beforehand. Mm. Yeah. How do they know? And this is what the shaman has trained a lot. The shamans know that, yes. Shamans yeah. have it. Uh, so it I would say that that's the instinctual brain. Yeah. <coughs> it's a, they have a healthy animal self. Yes. The same animal self that can say, I'm a son of a bitch. Yeah. It's the animal yeah. self that yeah. can tell you what to do yeah. and give you f good advice. Of course. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then there's uh, the, the, the mother brain. Uh, mm -hmm. We... we have idealized love, we have a very high concept of love, but we don't have much ability to love because we live in a competitive, violent world. Mm -hmm. There are many reasons that when it's not, not good business to love. Mm -hmm. And history is not moved by love, history is moved by more by violence. Yes. It's a violent history, you know, all the movement of history is very much uh, movement of power. Mm -hmm. So the this part of us, which is the mothering self, which that which which that is a part of us which uh, feels experience the other as ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like the love of the mother to, to, for the cub. Even in the animal world, the animal has this ability to feel the other is not other, but another part of it. Mm -hmm. And this is what Martin Buber calls the I-thou relationship. Mm -hmm. the thou is another I. Mm -hmm. It's not an it. Yes. So that is, you cannot get there with philosophy. You cannot get there through ideology. You have to have that part of the brain in you well functioning or not filtered out, not overpowered by the practical mind with its uh, orientation to pragmatic advantage. Well, that's a very interesting question you asked me whether the SAT program is related to shamanism because uh, there was a time when I prefer to call it that, like that. Ah, yeah. Interesting. That, uh, a training in, uh, for new shamans, for new shamans. has to do with the inner integration, yeah. with intuition, with freedom, with, yeah. with nearness to nature, and a yeah. constellation of things that comes from just being complete persons. Yes. Yeah. So there isn't so much difference between uh, shamans and certain kinds of mystics. Not Christian mystics, because Christian mystics begin by uh, putting out their animal self mm -hmm. so they can't get to the same yeah. place. Different. But it's uh, like getting to the spirit through some kind of simplification. Mm -hmm. Shaman gets... Uh, but a shaman is a mystic that uh, gets to the core experience out of which comes healing, out of which comes giving advice and becoming a chief, uh, out of which comes art, mm -hmm. 
yes. many abilities that are separate, uh, separate roles. Yeah. And there are medicine doctors that are not shamans, who, who, who know plants. And there are priests, in, even in so-called primitive cultures, people who are priests but are not shamans. Yes. They, they lead rituals, but it's a different matter. Oh yes, I'm in agreement. Uh, there's a Spanish saying, the medico, poeta y loco, todos tenemos un poco. There is a physician in us, there is a poet in us, and there is a madman in us. We each have a little bit of these three things. Ah, yeah. So in that mm -hmm. sense you could say we are, we are born to, with the potential of shamanism, mm -hmm. and it's very close to the potential of self-realization to become one, though there is a specialization in, in, in shamanism, like it's not the same thing to aspire to Buddhahood or to aspire to becoming shaman, yeah. because there you cultivate more the per shamanic perception, you cultivate more the powers. Yeah. In okay. Buddhism it comes at a very high stage. I have not come to high degree of shamanic uh, accomplishment, mm -hmm. though I think I have come quite far in the Buddhist way, mm -hmm. but not to the way, the level of cities, mm -hmm. uh, not, to, to, not to the being able to go into the mind of another mm -hmm. or project myself at a distance yes. and uh, do such things. Not only the sorcerer's apprentice and the shaman, but the sorcerer's apprentice and the and the enlightened being. Ah, okay. It's like a mm -hmm. it's a glimpse of enlightenment mm -hmm. that the ego takes hold of. Yes. If you see God, to speak metaphorically, if you have a contact of with some depth of your being or with a the deeper mind, or so you have spiritual experience, it would seem that it's a blessing to have spiritual experience, but it's a curse too, because the ego uh, cannot resist the temptation to use spiritual experience for, for its own aggrandizement. Yes. Like saying, I have been with God, mm -hmm. God is close to me, I am. Mm -hmm. I am on the way to becoming a bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it's gone. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, it gets in the way. It gets in the way of your development. I am not very competent to, mm. to do it because I have not personally followed the shamanic okay. path under the direction of a shaman. Mm -hmm. uh, the closest I know is I am following the Buddhist path under the guidance of a lama, and lamas are a form of shamanism. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are inheritors of traditional Tibetan shamanism. Yeah. They have mm -hmm. absorbed that, yeah. and so they have interaction with the spirit world, and they have very powerful blessings. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't even have a concept. Here my translator, mm -hmm. when I use the word blessing, she says uh, uh, like presence. Mm -hmm. he, she interprets it almost like a metaphor for uh, something giving you something good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is not the concept that there can be a spiritual energy that comes from the presence of another and can give a person good luck mm -hmm. or healing from a disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. protecting from danger and so forth. Yeah. Uh, in the Buddhist path, it's acknowledged that people who are high uh, have some kind of effect of this sort without their necessarily controlling it with will. Like many people say, I have performed miracles, mm -hmm. and I cannot say I have not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I have not 
consciously sought to do that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. People tell me, you appear in my dreams and you say very wise things that have an impact on me. And when I hear these stories, I know that that's not an ordinary dream. Mm -hmm. That's something that went beyond the person's mind. And it had to do with my influence. But I was not aware of sending of my yeah. myself yeah. to visit others. So I have the impression that I may be doing in things in my sleep that I don't know about in my conscious life. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I don't want to put it down and say, no, it's your illusions, it's your dreams, uh, uh, it's not true. Yeah. I think that would get in the way of something that perhaps is quite valid, but I don't have the development to do that consciously. Okay. And still, the, there is some magic. I have been so many years on the path that some something passes on and has uh, the effect of producing strange coincidences or other unusual phenomena. Synchronicities. Yes. Yeah. Compartments are opening up. This is very shamanistic, I think. Division. We're coming back to a more shamanic conception. Yeah. Especially when therapy comes together with the arts. Yeah, of like course. Dance yeah. therapy. Yeah. Music therapy. Psy music. Psychodrama. Yes, yes. All this uh, Fritz is. also worked a lot of uh, with this, yes. Also with the theater elements. Yes, of uh, course. Yes. He, he came from uh, co theater culture. Yes. It was his, his uh, hobby. Yes, there was a conference of the Association for Humanistic Psychology in Berkeley. I don't remember the year. It must have been in the 80s, I suppose, the early 80s, perhaps. Yeah. And I wanted to introduce a shaman uh, who was not an ethnic shaman, mm -hmm. but a Chilean friend mm -hmm. who was an architect. Ah, okay. And teaching... Uh, blind people to visualize space oh, okay. Interesting. With, through, uh, through networks of uh, wire and other materials, he constructed figures. Yeah. And uh, working in this way through his job, because he was assigned this job of working with the blind people, and he thought he could give them a sense of space that he had lost. Uh, doing this, he realized that it had effect in consciousness, the, the sense of space. Mm -hmm. And he started then working with other people, and he came to visit me and to demonstrate to me. And he was very good at giving you a sense of immensity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I regarded him as a shaman, the way he intuitively moved and the way he had developed a very unique way of working. I brought him to Germany because as a result of that conference there was a man called um, Mittelstenscheid, Dieter, Dieter Mittelstenscheid, uh, creator of Koloman, Centrum Koloman, mm -hmm. not, not too far from here, mm -hmm. uh, near Wasserburg, ah, Wasserburg. Mm -hmm. in that direction, yeah. Koloman Centrum. It's a little bit like an SLN uh, mm -hmm. in Germany, just like the sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was present in that meeting when I introduced this idea of neo-shamanism mm -hmm. as something inner rather than outer, mm -hmm. and that people could come to it without co even contact, without even contact with other shamans or knowing about shamanism. Yeah. So, and this was a man called uh, Sergio Miranda, but he called himself Tse, mm -hmm. <laughs> or Ze mm -hmm. in, in, in Spanish, or he used to Z. Different accent. So that that was the occasion, and so to me it had a magical uh, effect that it brought me to Europe for the first time to to work to do a workshop. Mm -hmm. so ah, I okay. Coloman Centrum. Uh, when was it? And, and in, in the eighties. Uh, I don't remember.
Well, I think uh, working with drums is part of a working with sound and with music. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more powerful to connect with holiness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sh shamanic healing has to do with uh, invoking the spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. Of drumming in particular, I'm not very... Uh, I don't have so much authority. I have seen Siberian shamans use their drums at the Vienna Conference of Sound Psych mm -hmm. the European Association for Psychotherapy. Yeah. I ah, was yeah. at the first meeting of that association. Ah, yeah. And there were a number of uh, Siberian shamans ah, okay. brought by Sh uh, Arner. Ah, okay. And one of them uh, talked about drumming in a very moving way of how drumming you could uh, express all kinds of things like whispers and uh, thunder and uh, 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 hear all kinds of things and express all kinds of things mm -hmm. through them. I don't have this is true, the, yes. a, a drumming culture to mm. go into it. Yes. But uh, the principle of expressing oneself through an instrument or a sound seems to be a, seems to me to be a more broader concept mm. of mm. expressing through sound. Uh, Mexican shamans do it with their voice. Yes. They're incredible singers. I have been in peyote sessions with mm -hmm. Mexican shamans. Mm -hmm. and they improvise song and the, but they have certain texts and they have certain legends, certain mm -hmm. say certain tales that they tell in their singing sessions. There are different kinds of art that are the specialty of different shamans. Mm -hmm. There are shamans that are painters. Yes, it's the Shipibo. Uh, uh, yes. There are the, the Icaros, the songs of the Ayahuasqueros. Yes, 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 yes. And then and the rattles they use in South America. Right? Yes. I guess it's all the same to get the focus, no? So you could say they are music therapists. <laughs> yeah. But it seems putting it a very it's a small box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> takes too much of the mystery away. I don't remember what Harner said. Mm -hmm. I remember that what Carlos said is more or less what appeared later mm -hmm. ah, yeah. in his first book. Mm -hmm. We brought along with us a uh, um, lady healer uh, from an uh, from an in a California Indian culture. She told a dream, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, which was an initiation dream, ah, yeah. where she had to. There were two hands extended to her, and she had to hold the correct hand ah. and she knew that one was life and the other was was missing the path ah, yeah, okay. but there was there was no way outer way of telling the, yeah okay even in a sense as ah, this is what uh, then Fritz then answered on that he yeah. is the shaman too yes that yeah. was when they, when Fritz said she, Fritz challenged her and said because there was a in that initiation dream there was a snake ah. and he said what does a snake mean to you? And she didn't, she didn't give a very good answer. Ah, okay. But the snake was hers. Yeah, yeah of course. Of <laughs> and course. she be, became a shaman. Yeah. But to Fritz, uh, with his competitiveness, it was as if he <laughs> felt, I know more about it. <laughs> the shamanism, a snake is a symbol of healing. Yes. <laughs> Hermes has a snake, and always a snake is a symbol of healing. The shaman did, could not say, as a, Snake is a symbol of she, of healing, <laughs> but she somehow <laughs> related very deeply with the snake. Anyhow, <laughs> okay. without being able to talk about it. <clears throat> yes. mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it's getting darker and darker. Yeah, the, there is lightning coming. I think so. Very nice. We're it's talking like about readings, shamanism. <laughs> readings, like.
Yes, I met him on that occasion of that workshop. And you was you were a very close friend of him, yes? I was his closest friend right. for mm -hmm. many years. Mm -hmm. And then we became distant at later in time. Mm -hmm. And but we had in interesting meetings all along, every now mm -hmm. and then he ap appeared. I didn't learn from him shamanism, I didn't learn mm -hmm. anything in particular. But it was something Unusual, sometimes unusual things happened, like for, when I came to Esalen with him, mm -hmm. at the door, when I was going to open the door of the great house in our first time I come, there comes out of the door Fritz Perls, mm -hmm. who would be so much part of my life. It was like Castaneda <laughs> brought me to meeting Fritz Perls. Right. We, we both met Fritz there yeah. and had a significant dialogue there. How uh, old were you then, when you met Fritz? About 33, I think. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we shared. He told me what of his experience. I told him of mine. Yeah. It was nothing but that. Sense of closeness. He said that I was the person who understood him better because he was probably in a world of too many academics who yeah. questioned things or in a world where people were interested but not really fellow seekers, mm -hmm. or not so highly motivated as seekers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as I was. Mm -hmm. But they had some uh, some time where he was not so happy with me. I, he came to see me after a long time uh, in a house. It was the house of my girlfriend I was living in at, at a certain time. There was a stream going through the back house, mm -hmm. and that we have chosen that house because of that stream, because of the influence of his mm -hmm. description of mm -hmm. working near a stream oh, okay. in, in his book. Yeah. And I was practicing working with, uh, in, in walking without shoes in that stream yeah. to get my soles of my feet uh, less uh, avoidant of the normal uh, pain. I don't yeah. have the ability to just, like a, yeah. when I when I did with, uh, was guided by Indians in the Putumayo, yeah. it was hell to yeah. walk with them in the river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. When they showed me the first time a yahya plant, I had to go with them in the river. Very painful. Uh, but not instead of going through the jungle. Yeah, yeah. It was very painful. So I was aware that this is something like a hang up. I have too much tension in my feet. Yeah. I must relax my feet learn something. So I was practicing that. Ah, yeah. And I was, um, <laughs> as I did it, I was sort of spontaneously contemplating uh, a snail, as if uh, gastropods, you know, gastropods, that's the name of the family of these animals. Mm -hmm. They have the belly in their feet. Ah. They, they walk with their belly. Ah, okay. Gastropods. Uh, and I was, uh, as I walked in, in this uh, rivulet, I was, I, I was sort of invoking being like a snail, being like mm -hmm. putting my hara into my feet mm -hmm. and uh, trusting the earth and mm -hmm. going into the earth. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit a shamanic experience. I was in, uh, evoking the spirit of an animal, feeling the animal in my body in some sense as a spiritual practice or a, as a as a, a healing practice, because I felt it fitted my needs. Yeah. Okay. And in that moment, he came to visit. It was a shamanic moment when he came. Yeah. After years. Mm -hmm. And then he gave me the manuscript of Tales of Power, and said, "I haven't given it to my publisher yet. I want you to see it first. So tell me what you think." And uh, that night, I went out with my girlfriend. I don't remember whether it was a movie or something else, and I left the book, uh, the manuscript, on my bed. I threw it on the bed you know, later. And uh, when I... No, my girlfriend had stayed in the house. I went out. And my girlfriend said that a coyote came into the house through uh, the cat door, 
which she had recently installed. She had a cat, and uh, for the cat to come in and out, only now she had installed a little opening, and there came from the river, from that little river. Not, I don't, not, I don't mean a coyote. It's a, uh, I say the wrong word. Um, a white comad cat? Comadreja, in Spanish. Uh, it's a rodent, a big rodent, who has almost human hands and uh, like a thief. Ah, okay. Uh, mm. Something around his eyes. How are these called? Uh, raccoon. 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 A raccoon came into the house mm -hmm. and came for the manuscript and stole the manuscript. No. And she had to <laughs> stop him and had a tug of war with the raccoon. No. And he took only the first page, only it covered. <laughs> and he, she said, very strange adventure. Very strange, yeah. <laughs> So, so I had to tell the story to Carlos of the same day. Your day, you, this happened to your manuscript, and he laughed and says, "Oh, there's power in it." It's <laughs> good. Oh my. And then I told other people, and nobody believed me. I think so. I remember telling Fritz of Capra about yeah. this, and he said to me, "What do you gain by telling these things?" <laughs> 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 he was right. It was not to my advantage to yeah. say these things. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. thrown into question I mean, as my invention. Uh, okay. Some things you better don't tell. <laughs> yeah. Esoteric. <laughs> yeah, it's esoteric things. <laughs> I didn't tell the end. Yeah. So in the end I told Carlos that this uh, story of falling, uh, dropping into the abyss, you know that story? where he's given an exercise to put his attention into his belly ah. and uh, concentrate to the exclusion of all th thoughts until he lost his body. Yes. And come into the abyss and dissolve his body. Yeah. And he does that uh -huh. while Don Gennaro and Don Juan are talking to both his ears. Yeah. To yeah. Him. So and then he only re remembers himself again when he's going through a revolving door in uh, in a hotel in Mexico City, so it's a story of translocation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I said to him, "That's a wonderful metaphor. When they threw you into the abyss mm -hmm. from your hair, from your mm -hmm. feet, mm -hmm. and you had to put your your weight into your belly and into your feet and dissolve your body." And he said very serious to me, you don't understand, this is not a metaphor. The, the magic of the Mexican Indians, they had to go, they had to survive the conquerors. So they're very powerful. And so he reproached me for not taking his tale of power more than as a tale of power. Mm -hmm. I took it to be something that if you believe it, it opens your mind mm -hmm. to certain experiences. Uh, that's how I understood the expression, tale of power. It's good to be a little superstitious, because if you believe in certain things, then certain things happen to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, uh, it's true. That, that was my uh, my reading. Yeah. But he says, no, you're, you're taking me still to, you're not open enough to <laughs> okay. But later, I uh, Charlie Tart wrote about uh, conscious-related states, as if yeah. there is a reality for different levels of consciousness. Yes. And, uh, and he had had some contact with Castaneda oh, yeah. that validated that, in some sense, it was something related mm -hmm. to a okay. point of view in a different consciousness. Not literally true. Mm -hmm. My reason to believe that there was Don Juan, that Don Juan was real, that there was somebody who opened him up, he learned from, my reason is that our conversations took place before he had in mind writing a book, mm -hmm. and 
he sometimes acted as a messenger between Don Juan and I. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he was doing it for an audience. He once told me, why don't you get into my car and we go right now to Sonora mm -hmm. and we visit Don Juan. Mm -hmm. He wants to meet you. Mm -hmm. And I had a problem with my passport. Oh. I had what was called a G1 visa. Good for coming into the United States for one time for a given purpose. I was on a Guggenheim Fellowship. Oh, yeah. So I thought, if I go to Mexico now, I won't be able to get in with a... Yeah. I will lose this visa because I have not respected its rules. I understand. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't have known that. Mm -hmm. I didn't give him credit for having known. At least he pre didn't present himself at the time yeah. as a, such an exp expert magician that he could yeah. know such details. Yeah. He seemed um, innocently saying, get in my car. Yeah. And I said to him, no, I don't want to risk it. I could have problem yeah, with, uh, with my stay here. Yeah. So that gives me the sense that he was believing that, uh, that he was not doubting the that he was taking for granted that we would meet Don Juan. Mm. And there were f a few messages coming and going. Mm. So basically, on the, because I wanted to acquaint him with ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and he was interested through me to know that. And mm. It's not physical pain. Yeah. It's in shaman it's and shamanic practice sometimes it's physical. Pain. Yes, of course. Like in American Indians hanging from the Sundance. Yes, yeah. hanging from the skin of the yeah. chest. Uh, I think uh, it depends on the shaman. Uh, there's some people who are so gifted, so ready to receive, mm -hmm. that they don't need such great pain. Mm -hmm. There are people in which there is a discrepancy. They don't have that ability mm. and they want to be shamans anyhow. <laughs> yeah. And then they need the pain. <laughs> <laughs> and there are people who have a pain of a different nature. Mm -hmm. They don't have to look for the ordeals. They don't have to go through the cutting of the tongue or putting mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. thorns be yeah. under their nails like some Australians do. Yeah. They don't need that because the pain of existence, the pain of loss of the soul, the pain of... Yeah, uh, the illness we talked about yesterday. The, no? the sense of needing to find themselves. Yeah. This, that despair is greater than anything. Yeah, of course. It's a descent into health where you don't need the, to be pushed there by others or yeah. put to a test. Yes. So, uh, shamans, I think, do, do visit hell. Yeah. But through me different means. Sometimes it may be smallpox or a polar bear almost killing you. Mm. And sometimes mm -hmm. it may be a more natural journey. This person, Totil Albert, yeah. uh, had a descent into hell that was for the, the death of his parents. Oh, yeah. And some people uh, have enough suffering in their lives yeah. that has been just covered over. So when you do therapy, all this pain comes up, and so many people are near killing themselves or are in des desperate. Yeah. And so you don't need, need the, always to do it through. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> traditional uh, means. Yes. yes. Uh, I had a, when I was with Groff in Spain um, a few years ago. I I had a vision of a big um, snake of energy which was eating me up while I was drumming in the jungle. Yeah. And. I never was in the jungle and until then I did not know that I will go there. And when the shaman in, um, invited me to Ecuador, uh, I had in this initiation rituals, ritual, I had uh, this same vision. Ah. This, and I was drumming the whole day and night in the jungle and then the snake came and eat me up. So it's, it's very similar and I had a prevision two years before. I remember reading uh, of such uh, such uh, image of uh, being eaten by a snake mm -hmm. in Eliade's uh, yes. Mircea Eliade's collection of uh, 
information on shamanism from different cultures. Yes. And uh, I was once giving LSD, no, I was giving the principle, the alkaloid of ayahuasca to a very well-known therapist in America, Leo Zeff. Mm -hmm. There was a book written about him called The Secret Chief. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a very good person for psychedelic therapy in the days when it was uh, already forbidden. Yes. And so I gave him this session uh, and he was confronted by the speck snake. Aye, aye, aye. And because I had read about shamans being eaten by a snake, I encouraged him to let him, <laughs> let, his, let himself be eaten. And he did, and he then found himself in the belly of the snake, dissolving, and then he became the snake, and discovered the snake was God. <laughs> he Good. got a yeah. mystical ecstasy. Yeah. And a whole shamanic trip without any information. Only because LSD is such a yeah powerful uh, such a catalyst for things that are.